Welcome everybody to the Home School Plus Conference. Um, I'm happy to introduce Heather Martinson. Um, Heather has been involved with homeschooling since the 80s when her younger siblings were homeschooled. She has learned throughout her homeschool journey and in 2006 started Celebration Education, a unique program for homeschoolers and soon to be expanded to a full-time private school. I'd like to thank our sponsors and supporters, Homeschool Life, G3, Homeschool Education Magazine, and of course, Blackboard Collaborate. Um, if everybody would like to show us where they're from, if you see on the left-hand side of the whiteboard, the second symbol down is the sun, the star. If you'd like to click on it, and put it where you are in the world and also write in the chat box where you're from, what the time is, where you are um, and anything else interesting about yourself. Okay, um, Heather, if you'd like to start. All right, well, thank you. I'm really glad to be here today. This is a new experience for me doing an online seminar. This is a, a speech though that I've given in many different venues, and um, I'm just happy to share it because I love uh, the, to share the many things that I've learned through our homeschool journey. Um, as I started homeschooling when my, uh, with my oldest, who's now 25. Um, I knew before she was even born that we were going to homeschool, so it's been a long, uh, wonderful many years. Uh, and what I've learned um, throughout my years is that the, the things that people do in a traditional classroom are not necessarily the best methods for educating children. Um, I've learned that Methods used in the classroom are done of necessity when you have so many children all in one place that there are certain tactics that you end up using, but in a homeschool situation, they're irrelevant and they um, have no, they don't need to come into play when we're homeschooling our children one on one. It's a, it's a whole different dynamic. And so, um, and beyond that, I've learned a lot of different things about education in general. And these are the things that I'm going to be sharing with you today. So um, uh, as a child growing up, uh, a lot of times there were, we would, uh, in our history lessons, we would learn about certain admirable people who have done amazing things in their lives. And from time to time, they'll say, isn't it amazing how much, for example, Abraham Lincoln did in his lifetime with um, almost zero formal education, as if it's further proof that Abraham Lincoln is just this amazing, wonderful genius. I'm, I'm convinced he is a genius, but I'm not convinced that it's because um, that he was just because he was born with it, but also because um, of the opportunity he was given because he was not in a classroom. As well as the other figures held um, on in this picture here, they were not, they did not have to be in a classroom. They were allowed to learn and grow in a much more organic, much more natural way, um, which made them individuals and gave them the opportunity to uh, increase their own personal geniuses. And that's the type of thing that I would like to see for my own children. Um, for example, back in 1910, this is the type of transportation there was. Today, our transportation has changed an awful lot. We um, don't use the same transportation at all. Um, in 1842, this was cutting edge communication. Today, it's so different. We still do read printed books, but there's so many more opportunities and, and things that we can use to communicate. Sadly, in 1897, a classroom would, might look like this, and today the classroom is just about the same. Um, there's not a lot of change that has happened in 
education over the last decades and 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 um, centuries, for that matter. Uh, people keep talking and talking and talking about improving education, changing education, making education better. But as far as I can see, the only thing that they're really doing is expecting more of the same. The same things that have been done for tens and hundreds of years, they're trying to just say, oh, all we need is more of that, um, is, is the way it feels to me. And there are not very many people who are actually looking at making a change in education from the foundation up. Just throw everything out the window, start fresh. And um, that's the type of change that I personally would like to see. Um, so, so there are several myths that we're going to be talking about. Um, first one for me is almost a pet peeve, that, that uh, safe campus is, equals a good learning environment. Um, and indeed, it is important to have a safe campus. Um, Wikipedia says the classroom attempts to provide a safe place where learning can take place uninterrupted by other distractions. Um, when I, I type this in myself, uh, when I go to school, I feel, and these are the results that came up, I feel sick, uh, I feel depressed, I feel sad, um, and this is, these are the top results of how people really feel when they go to school. There's something missing. The, the, the fact that um, children are, are provided for physically is far from enough. Um, children need to be provided for emotionally, mentally, many different ways. Um, we all know that there's a bullying problem in many schools. Uh, as much as the schools try to address it, it still happens. Um, and not only from fellow students, but from teachers as well who belittle children. I think it's, it's very detrimental for an, a learning child to be treated as if they're stupid or inappropriate or, you know, that they're not good people. Um, in addition, uh, the usual tactics of testing, grading, and categorizing by ability is, can be seen as threats, where the students feel like what they're doing may not, may not live up to expectations, and therefore they're not good enough and um, not valuable. Um, so these things, all of these things can add to a poor learning environment. I like this. I, I'm, I belong to um, Disneyland's Facebook page, and one time, just out of the blue, they put, when I walk into Disneyland, I feel, and page after page after page just filled up very quickly, but I put three examples here, and these are common things that people would feel when they walk into Disneyland. I feel like in everything on Earth just got a little bit better. I feel like I am home. I feel like living here, a magical place full of happiness. Now, in my opinion, why? I, I strongly feel that a school should bring about these emotions. Not that everyone's going to school to be entertained, but because they're going to a place that they feel comfortable, like everything is going to be okay, like they're safe, like they're home, uh, and that there are unlimited possibilities, that, that a child coming into um, uh, school should feel like this is a place where they're going to be enriched, this is a place where they're going to become a better person. It should be a good, positive experience just by walking in. Uh, because emotion is a gatekeeper to learning performance. Um, if a child does not feel safe physically, emotionally, mentally, if they're in any way they do not feel safe, then they're not going to feel comfortable. Their, their minds are going to be closed down to the further and better learning experiences. Here's a couple pictures of some of our students at Celebration Education, the um, school that we started, um, just having a wonderful time. They love what they're doing. They love the environment. They're exploring and, and uh, participating in their learning. Um, and schools, instead of having a cluttered environment, it should be enriched. It should um, complement the things that the students are learning. This actually is from a museum. I don't have my school yet. So I'm using pictures of what could possibly be. Um, this, and I, and I think it's very important that children have some type of natural setting in their lives that they can, uh, that they can just walk right out the school door, out the back door, or whatever, and, and into nature. They can touch grass and leaves and dirt. And I think that's very important to keep a connection with the earth and feel that um, 
that they are part of it as well. Um, okay, our next myth is that a compulsory education means that all children will learn. It's been a long time since all states have made uh, compulsory education laws, and it has not necessarily improved the education of all the children. Um, but children learn better when they're not compelled, but that when they take an interest in what they are learning from. At Celebration Education, we use themes. Every year we have a year-long theme to bring in an interest to the students. And these various pictures here are pictures of the themes that we've used in the past. We have our, let's see, I don't know if you can see my pointer. Um, I don't know how to use a pointer. Maybe that's a pointer. This is our uh, adventure at the museum with a dinosaur here. That was based on Night at the Museum movies, which a third is coming out soon. We're really excited. We might redo, revisit this theme. This the Explore theme was based on uh, exploring various parts of the world and their different biomes. This, our excellent adventure, was based on Bill and Ted's excellent adventure. We went throughout the world kidnapping various um, historical figures and learning about them and their places and their cultures. Uh, Visions of a Better World is all based on Leonardo da Vinci, one of our favorite uh, themes that we've done a couple times and kind of a, our signature theme for the year. Crafting a Country is what we did last year, where we did American history uh, through Minecraft. And um, that, that theme itself has been very popular. And at this point, we're actually selling that theme to other teachers and schools that are interested in using the Crafting a Country uh, uh, lessons and the Minecraft events that we've included. Um, the topics, uh, the uh, topics that are taught um, are these, well, these themes, these year-long themes are actually voted on by the parents. I usually come up with a few different themes that I'd be willing to write lessons for, and then all the families get to vote and choose which theme that they would like to see. Uh, this Wishes one was all based on Disneyland. We uh, spent a year learning all about the many things that, that Walt Disney was inspired by as he made Disneyland. Raiders of the Renaissance Mines was about several different great mines throughout history. And our theme for this coming year is SteamWorld. This is uh, based on Jules Verne's Around the World in 80 Days. So we're going to vis be visiting many parts of the world. And also, we're throwing in our science, technology, engineering, arts, and math all along the way. So we're going to have a lot of fun. Now, the kids can vote for the themes as well, except for we use, we use SurveyMonkey. So if they get a, have a separate account, uh, email account, they may be able to get a separate vote from their parents. Usually the parents will confide in the children before they vote. OK, um, moving on. Mm -hmm. Also, one of the things we do is we don't, we don't segregate our school subjects. Um, we don't take all the interesting learning tidbits and break it down into subject by subject. Um, as a, shown here in this slide, which would you rather eat, the individual ingredients or the prepared cake? The pre prepared cake is so much better. It, nobody wants to eat the individual ingredients one at a time. And it's the same thing with learning. Children really enjoy really delving into a, a, a subject, but they don't necessarily have to, be, have to tear it up bit by bit until it becomes these tiny mis miscule uh, tasks in separate subjects that kind of take all the flavor and enjoyment out of it. We uh, are thematic, and so uh, we use several subjects in each of our lessons, all mixed in together to make a really tasty experience. And we give our uh, children choices. We offer a smorgasbord of learning opportunities, and the children are allowed to pick and choose from among the tastiest uh, items there. What I find is this is this right here is one of the most magical parts of the whole thing because when children are allowed to make these choices, they um, they it's it's almost magic because they choose it. They don't like the things that are too hard. 
And they're not going to choose something that's too easy because that's baby stuff. They are very good at choosing the material that's right at their level, that's just going to stretch them just enough to, to move them forward because they do like to learn. They like to be challenged. They like to do something they've never done before. So giving them the choices, um, they're going to pick stuff sometimes better than you would even expect. Um, and at, at right at their level and within their, their learning styles, and um, and their own genius, I like to call it their their own um, what they're good at, what they're what they should be doing more of to make themselves individuals, like the geniuses we talked about at the beginning of the lecture. We also allow for a lot of curiosity um, that uh, many times I prefer the questions before the answers in school. Traditionally, the children are given all the answers, and then they don't get the questions until the end. And then if they look at the answers again, they're cheating. But what's wrong with, uh, how about if the questions came first? What if the questions came from the students? And then they have the opportunity to follow their curiosity and research and um, study and in, uh, um, dissect until their curiosity has been satisfied. Um, also, an important element should be adequate time. John Taylor Gatto said, I teach kids to turn off, to, I'm sorry, to turn on and off like a light switch. I demand that they become totally involved in my lessons, jumping up and down in their seats with anticipation, competing vigorously with each other for my favor. But when the bell rings, I insist, insist that they drop the work at once and proceed quickly to the next workstation. Nothing important is ever finished in my class, nor in any other class I know of. The lesson of bells is that no work is worth finishing, so why care too deeply about anything? Bells inoculate each undertaking with indifference. We don't want our children to be indifferent about the learning. We want them to have as, use as much time as they want to explore and learn from, their, um, the, from the topics that are presented to them or that they choose. And indeed, with that adequate time, they have the opportunity to master. Um, one of my mentors in learning, in my homeschool journey and in um, learning more natural and appropriate ways of learning, uh, taught me, told me that one time sh her children were studying caves. And they took and made their bathroom into an entire cave where they had animals, and they had darkness, they had moisture, stalactites and stalagmites, and it was, the bathroom was like that for two whole weeks while the children just had a great time creating this cave environment in their bathroom. And this is so different from giving a child a worksheet and saying, here, fill this in. Because if they had a worksheet and they filled it in, it'd be thrown away the next day, nobody cares. But with mastery, those children are never going to forget the animals that they placed in that bathroom. They're going to remember these things as indelible and, and, and um, a lot more memorable than the limited time experiences that so many of learning experiences are. Okay, next myth is that more words represent higher intelligence, meaning the more words that you know and understand that you're smarter. But we know that there are multiple intelligences, that children learn in many different ways and can be genius in many different ways. I like that word genius. I think everybody has some. Um, that the traditional schools, for the most part, only recognize and value the um, number smart and word smart. Indeed, those are the two um, intelligences that are easiest to measure and grade. However, we know that all of these other intelligences, plus others that may be identified uh, depending on how you break things down, um, are very important. That success in life is not by number smart and word smart alone. As a matter of fact, we've all met people who have these other intelligences but are, do not do well with numbers and words necessarily and are extremely successful with their sports or with their music or with their art or um, in knowing themselves or with interpersonal relationships. All of these intelligences should be valued and respected. Um, and I think it's, 
it's sad and remorseful that in schools only these two intelligences are valued because the children who have the other intelligences are being frankly left behind. They should be, they need to be able to learn within their intelligences and to, and to grow their intelligences to become the person who they are, who they're meant to be, the individual, not the same as everyone else. We want all of these in our real life people. All right, next myth. More death time means more learning. Sometimes your heart just swells with joy seeing all the little children in their desk sitting so nice and neat and raising their hands on cue, but no, it kind of makes me sick. Children need to move. Sitting at a desk for six hours a day is not the way their body was designed to, to function. And indeed, children actually need to move in order to learn better. When sitting for too long, your brain does not get as much, that much oxygen. Children get bored. Children get fidgety. They're fidgety because they need to move. Um, when we do our homeschool classes, movement is a part of every lesson. The children never sit still for long. Um, Okay, Ad additionally, what you can learn from a desk is limited. Here is a definition of a creature that I pulled from uh, Wikipedia. It says, these are spiny, hard-skinned animals that live on the rocky seafloor. These inver invertebrates are not fish, they're echinoderms. They move very slowly along the seabed using hundreds of tiny tube feet. There are over 2,000 different species of these worldwide. Now, when I give this lecture in real life, I usually have somebody from the audience movement, right? So if you're not, I mean, I like to have movement in my lectures as well. I usually bring somebody up from the audience to come and draw this creature on the whiteboard. And what I usually come get is something like this, sometimes a little more elongated, like a sea cucumber or something. But it's a spiny creature. Who knows? Uh, it just guesses what it might look like. Um, but in reality, what is being described is a sea star or a starfish. Now, um, with text alone, the student is not getting the full picture. Uh, so better is when there is a picture involved. If this picture right here was sitting next to that definition, it would have been obvious. You, you wouldn't have thought anything other than that it was describing a starfish. So, um, so words alone are not enough, but um, adding in pictures makes it even better. Beyond pictures, though, um, if you were to actually bring a starfish into the classroom, or a representation of a starfish. But when I give these lectures and I pull out a starfish, a real starfish, well, dead, but you know, I pull it out, This then that is the time when, for the first time in my entire lecture, if there are any children in the room, all of a sudden they're perking up and they're trying to look over the other adults' heads to look at what I'm holding in my hand. It's something interesting. They want to see it and they want to touch it. They want to experience it. So when we can give them real objects it's even better. Beyond that, though, of course, would be to take them, go ahead and take them to the tide poles. Let them get their feet wet. Let them touch the starfishes as they live in the wild. Let them um, experience. They're, they're going to be learning not just about the starfish, but about the starfish's environment. They're going to feel the cool breezes. They're going to have multi-sensory input to what they're learning such a rich experience as compared to simply reading about it um, in, a, in a textbook or something. Now, I'm not saying that, it, that you, there's no, not a place for the printed word. It's, certainly there is. But um, if you're leaving out all these other experiences, you're not getting the full experience, the full education that is available to you. The sooner the child gets into the real world, the better. This is a, a trek that we went on one year. We were talking about pioneers, and so we dressed up and borrowed some hand carts and went on our trek. That was a lot of fun. Um, next myth, past tests mean learning happened. All right. Actually, testing, for the most part, is a poor form of assessment. Um, here's two examples right here that show filling in the blanks or coloring the bubbles um, is 
you know, I mean, it's the common assessments that are given in traditional schools. However, um, Bloom's taxonomy of educational objectives. This, Mr. Bloom had this, he challenged schools to have many different ways to uh, assess what a child has learned. Um, taking tests such as filling the bubbles and uh, filling in the work, you know, the in the blank, um, only test to see how much knowledge and comprehension has been retained, at least for that short period of time between the information being given until the test time. Unfortunately, though, they, these are not very deep learning experiences. Just plain knowledge and comprehension does not delve very deep into the subject itself. And it's what, as I show here, it's just the tip of the iceberg. Beyond that, we have application, analysis, synthesis, and evaluation. These things, if the students are able to um, have these experiences in their learning and in, in the things that they return to the teachers, so to speak, are the things that are actually going to show them that they have a better understanding of the topic, that they're able to apply what was learned or analyze what was learned, or to take the information that was learned, change it and synthesize it into something else, make it some new thing, or even to evaluate if it's even worthwhile at all, to have the opportunity to say, I don't care for this, I don't think it's important. Um, all of this creates deeper learning experience. Even to, even to reject it, you might um, first know why. You, why is it being rejected? All of these things um, provide for much deeper learning experiences. And so um, we do a lot of projects at Celebration Education. Here, right here, their students are dissecting a sheep brain in our, on our, uh, when we were talking about how brains work one week. All right, our next myth. High standards means no child is left behind. Well, um, gosh, um, I don't really want to take the time to, well, maybe I do. Um, but the animal school um, is that there was a, let me see if I, I'm sorry, I, I should have pulled this up sooner. I'm just going to see if I can pull it up real quick. Um, the story of the various animals that wanted to go to to take a school, to, they, they formed a school together, and they formed a curriculum to go with this school. Let me see. Hold on. Sorry about this. I should have done this before. I hate dead time. Okay, so here it is. I'm just going to read it real quick. Um, it's the animal school of fable by George Revis. Once upon a time, the animals decided they must do something heroic to meet the problems of a new world. So they organized the school. They had adopted an activity curriculum consisting of running, climbing, swimming, and flying. To make it easier to administer the curriculum, all the animals took all the subjects. And that's honestly, that's what they do in public schools and, and other traditional schools. They make it easier to administer the curriculum. And, but it, that's, what it, that's what it comes down to you when you have that many students in a single place. As homeschoolers, we have a lot more flexibility because we don't need to have, we don't need, the tactics are just completely different. So anyway, I'll continue. The duck was excellent in swimming, in fact, better than his instructor. But he made only passing grades in flying and was very poor in running. Since he was slow in running, he had to stay after school and also drop swimming in order to practice running. This was kept up until his web feet were badly torn and he was only average in swimming. But average was acceptable, ac acceptable in school, so nobody worried about that except the duck. The rabbit started at the top of the class in running but had a nervous breakdown because of so much makeup work in swimming. The squirrel was excellent in climbing until he developed frustration in the flying class where the, his teacher made him stop, start from the ground up instead of the tree top down. He also developed a Charlie, ho Charlie horse from overexertion and then got a C in climbing and D in running. The eagle was a problem child and was disciplined severely. In the climbing class, he beat all the others to the top of the tree but insisted on, doing, on using his own way to get there. At the end of the year, an abnormal eel that could swim exceedingly well and also run, climb, and fly a little had the highest average and was valedictorian. 
The prairie dogs stayed out, of, stayed out of school and fought the tax levy because the administration would not add digging and burrowing to the curriculum. They apprenticed their children to a badger and later joined the groundhogs and gophers to start a successful private school. Okay, so that's a fun little fable, but you understand the, the problem is with, uh, with having high standards is there is no standard child. I don't believe there is a standard child or a common child. I believe that every child has unique abilities that should be used and expressed and that by trying to make every, all children live to a certain standard, it, it denies what's special about each individual. And I think it, it, it's important that we uh, appreciate and validate what's unique and individual about every single child. Okay, next myth, homework ensures that material will be learned. Um, first of all, homework is kind of frustrating because um, the, the brain, not just students need immediate feedback, but the brain itself needs immediate feedback. If you do something incorrectly, your brain doesn't know it unless it's told so. If you, if you let that um, incorrect information sit in the brain for long enough, it will become true as far as the brain is concerned. Um, when working one-on-one, -on -one, for example, in a homeschool situation, you're not going to tell your child, um, no, I'll let you know later if it's correct or not. You go ahead and let them know right now. Unfortunately, in a school situation, a teacher gives out homework in um, one day, and the students go home that day to do their homework, return it the next day, and then the teacher takes that homework home that day. So it's not until two days later that the student could be getting the feedback. By then, they really don't care. There's a grade on the thing. They're not going to correct it. They're not going to find out what they did wrong. It's, it's done. Whatever the correct or incorrect, it sticks. Um, and they don't, they don't get the privilege or the, the uh, luxury of the immediate feedback that the brain really wants. Okay. As a matter of fact, uh, be, uh, what a lot of schools have now started doing what they call flipping the classroom, where, where the students for homework are actually given the lecture, a video of some sort, or something that they do to learn to be, first be introduced to the activity. And then the, the worksheets and, and um, you know, the follow-up work then is done in the classroom where the teacher is. So that if they're doing anything wrong, if they have, if they're, instead of creating bad habits, the teacher's there to help guide them through and, and learn it correctly. I think it's a great, a, a great idea for these, especially for crowded classrooms. Yes, Alfie Cohen, perfect. Um, okay, next myth. Children who are forced to learn are smart children. Uh, people believe that if children never go to school, they're never going to learn anything, they're never going to be successful in life, they're going to be failures, and they're going to be homeless, they're going to be uh, a problem to society. Um, but unfortunately, um, through threats and fear is not a good way to encourage children to learn. Um, as a matter of fact, um, it has been said that we have what's called a triune brain, where we have these three sections of the brain. The reptilian brain being the one where um, our basic and most core uh, functions of our body, if, um, and this is where we have our fight or flight. If something is not right, if we feel threatened, we're going to want to um, fight it or run away. Um, the limbic system in, in includes our emotions, and the neocortex is where our higher learning functions happen. Now, this is where we want to be. But when we feel threatened, this is where we are. It's more difficult to learn um, while the threats are going on. This kind of reflects back to when we were talking about bullying. When a child feels unsafe, they're, they're in this uh, part of the brain. And they don't have the opportunity to learn as well because their function is not in the higher learning areas. So we want, to, we want to keep it light, we want to keep it fun, we want to keep it interesting. And uh, Speaking of the different motivations, the one was by threats and fear, you'll never amount to anything so you need to learn, or there is hope for reward. Some people feel, uh, Alfie Cohen again, of course, um, some people feel that uh, children should be given rewards for doing well in their work. And I admit 
that rewards are better than um, than um, fear and punishment. However, reward is still not actually the best. Um, sometimes children, rewards themselves can lead to fear of punishment, thinking that if they don't get the reward, then they're not good people. Um, but on top of that, uh, the rewards can actually alter the way the children learn. I have this interesting story. One time my son was drawing flames, of all things. He was young, probably about six. He was on the floor of the living room and just drawing all these great flames. I don't remember what, he, what was burning, but he was drawing flames. And um, there's this one particular interesting looking flame that I mentioned to him that I like that flame. And he continued drawing. And a few minutes later, I came back and every single new flame that he drew was that same flame that I complimented. And so I realized that I had stunted his creativity by just plain saying, I like that flame. So I, I don't feel like that's going to ruin him for life, but it gives you the example of what the reward can. Yes, we can make those kids jump through hoops. We can make them do a dog and pony show for us, but they're not necessarily going to be, we might be removing creativity from them. We might be removing, there's a lot of, danger in using rewards for um, as an as an incentive for children to learn the best way for, the reason for children to learn is because it's the right thing to do when they feel interested in a subject when they feel like they're, they're learning like what they're doing is valuable when it has meaning to them they're going to do it because they want to simply because they, there's a, a great big wonderful world out there and they want to be part of it. They want to touch it, see it, do it, experience it. And that's where I like to see the students be because it's the right thing to do. All right, uh, there's a myth that children can only learn from credentialed teachers. Um, I'm starting up a full-time private school right now and some some people are concerned that I'm not interested in learning from credential teachers. Frankly, I've hired credential teachers in the past, but they were more problematic than our non-credential teachers. They're accustomed to teaching in a classroom and using those tactics that I've been talking about that are not necessary on a smaller one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, but indeed, children learn from a lot more places than simply in a classroom or from a credential teacher. They can learn from their environment. We go on a lot of field trips in our uh, school situation, in our, in our homeschool groups. And of course, lots of making sure that the children have lots of reading material, things for them to explore and learn um, materially as well. There are um, a lot of different ways to give them the, a good environment that makes them, it, it's almost like it just absorbs them in as they are surrounded by wonderful things that they that they like to be a part of. Um, children can learn from their parents. We see that all the time. If you're a homeschooler, you know that they learn from you all the time. Even if you're not homeschooling, they're learning from you. Uh, sometimes things we don't want them to learn if we're being a bad example, if, if we're not careful. Um, but they're always learning from our from their parents and they can learn just as well from their parents um, who care than from a teacher with 30 children in the classroom. Children learn through collaboration. This is uh, one of our classes where these three students were working together and you see they're enjoying themselves as well. And many of you may be familiar with the hole in the wall experiment in India. Um, where an, a computer was simply set in a hole in the wall and the children were allowed to, they were not taught anything about how to use the computer, but they just played with it. They would just walk up to the hole in the wall and interact with it. And before long, um, the te children were teaching each other. They wanted to share what they knew and they were excited to say, oh, come here, you know, and, and or try to push that. They, they were working together to learn and they um, together learned an awful lot, including uh, apparently some English and how to use a computer. They were asking for more RAM and other things that um, they felt that they needed to, to have a better computer system as, as often kids do once they're starting to use a computer. Uh, our next myth is that learning is hard, boring work. Some people feel that uh, 
learning has become too easy for children. I've actually heard somebody say that before, that, that you can just Google anything and learn it. Well, actually, that's good. Again, like how the, the brain likes um, immediate feedback. If you have a question and it can be answered quickly, it's more likely to stick in your brain. So it's good that we can learn easily. Um, as a matter of fact, learning is the excitement of a hunt. When Michelangelo was a uh, teenager, he was once working on a sculpture. And a friend of his came up and said, hey, let's go hunting. And um, Michelangelo was like, no, that's OK. I'm, I'm working on, on this sculpture. I'm, I'm busy, but thanks. And his friend says, are you kidding? Come on. It's a great day. We got we to gotta go. Let's go. We're, we're all going to go hunting. And um, Michelangelo said, you know, for me, this carving this sculpture is the excitement of the hunt. So um, the same thing with learning. I'm not saying that, that, the, that children can't go off and play with their friends sometimes, but that learning itself can be so exciting and so inviting that they want to do it. They want to be part of it. They want to, they, and I'm sure you've, you've had students where they just want to see it, touch it, do it, experience it, wrap it around them, roll in it, because they're interested and they want to be part of it. Um, our last myth is that it's impossible to change schools. I believe that is not the case. I think the future of education is exciting. We can create uh, more open classrooms where children are allowed to, to um, be creative, to uh, work amongst themselves, to follow their interests. And um, as we talked about these intelligent people at the top of the hour, I believe that the next set of intelligent people are on the earth today, that they are creating many wonderful things and are doing it outside of classrooms. They're doing it on their own times. They're doing it within their own geniuses. And that um, it's almost at this point a very select few people, but it is growing. And that's what I think is exciting, that I get to be part of it and any of you can be part of it that um, the future of education is going to be completely different, that we can all help bring that to the world. And that's what I challenge to all of you from wherever you are. And I thank you for being with us today. Does anybody have any questions? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, let's see. How do you personally distinguish homeschooling from unschooling? You know, I don't, honestly. I believe that what I do with my children would be considered unschooling because they follow their own interests and we don't use set curriculums. But um, I, you know, to me, learning and living is the same thing. And I guess that's unschooling. And to me, I just, I don't think there's a need to differentiate between homeschooling and unschooling. We do it at home, so we, I call it homeschooling. But, uh, and unschooling can be, I don't know, so many def definitions. So I just, I just kind of leave it at that. I don't know. Um. Any other questions? Oh, dig it. Wait, I just realized I have more slides. What are they? Oh, they're not mine. Okay, making sure. I didn't leave anything out. Well, I'm glad you guys appreciated the uh, the speech. I, I totally, I absolutely enjoy sharing these things. I think um, that this is a wonderful time that we live in, that we can, we can um, try these new things. There were times when a person like me would be put in jail for even suggesting it so or, or trying it on their own children that it's wonderful the opportunities that we have I see three people are typing right now perhaps oh thank you Sabrina Yes, um, I, we do. I do plan on getting. I, I've had celebration education on the Aero site for a long time. Uh, 
although it's been just a homeschool program that we we bring we've been bringing to uh, several cities in Southern California. But uh, this is the first time that we're going to be having a facility of our own well, that we're sharing, that we're really looking forward to having the full-time program. But uh, the big announcement has not yet quite gone out, um, as the facility has got a couple things that they need to do to prepare, which is making us completely nervous because fall, I mean, some people are already starting school. Um, in that area, school doesn't start until the um, early next month, but we will be, um, we've got a, we've got a big, uh, a lot ahead of us, but I think we will hopefully find people who are like-minded and ready to jump on to the bandwagon and, and use these exciting learning experiences. Oh, thank you. I'm not sure how to say your name. Piyush, Piyush? Maru? Uh, thank you. That's a nice compliment. Oh, well, I'm glad you're with us, Sabrina. I'm glad you can, um, that you feel confident enough to look around and try some other things. Sorry, I lost my sound. Um, just then. Oh. If anybody wants to ask a question, um, I can give you uh, microphone privileges. So if you'd like to put your hand up, it's just right up underneath your name. There are four icons. Do you see the hand? You can raise it and I can let you talk. Um, are there any other questions for Heather? I'm going to stop the uh, recording. All right. Thank you very, very much, Heather. That was so interesting. Oh, good. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I enjoyed it very much. I'm sure everybody did as well. Okay, I'm stopping the recording.